Good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you all. When Fricky and I are out in New Jersey visiting Wynn's mother, so we are in a different location, but through the great mystery of the internet, we still get together in these ways. So take a moment, feel free to look around, just uh, building that sense of community and even appreciating that we get to be here in this way. Being grateful for that. And you might've noticed I pasted a chant that we're gonna do this morning. Of course, I have all of you on mute, but you'll hear my voice and then just feel free to chant along. This is a very well-known teaching from the Buddha, the five subjects for frequent recollection. And this is something you can bring to mind every day when you get up, before you go to bed or before a meditation period. And it's something not just to do out of habit, but to contemplate the meaning of each of these five reflections for a few seconds. So let's do that. And then we'll begin our sitting time right after this reflection. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is fine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. Thus we should frequently Recollect. And then settling, listen to the body and out of kindness, making any adjustments you need to make. And because this is in a very real sense, our sacred work, this sitting practice, we want to respect it. That doesn't mean that we need to be tight in the mind or in the body, but just that sense of respect, that sincerity as we're sitting relaxed and relatively upright, holding the body relatively still as best as we can. And the stillness of the body comes from a sense of release and relaxation, not from physical tension. So before we begin with some habitual way of meditating, just observing right now here, 
this possibility of non-distraction, just contemplating what that experience of non-distraction might be. So basically we'll notice moments of distractedness, what appears to you to be distractedness and moments hopefully of non-distractedness. And so we're just taking a minute or two and clarifying each of us for ourselves. What is the experience of distraction? What is actually the experience of non-distraction? So just check that out. The Buddha's teachings, they're really a wisdom path, very reliant on what we call wise view or wise understanding. And in terms of our meditation practice, right from the start, even when we're a brand new beginner at meditation, we're given a pointing out about the nature of the mind. And it's something like this activity of the knowing mind, both the objects, the experiences that are being known and the knowing itself, all of this is nature. The mind, the knowing mind, the activity of the mind, all of this is nature, not self. And we're hearing this, of course, intellectually, conceptually, that's okay. So really the essence of our practice are those two things, getting interested in non-distraction and letting that pointing out instruction, just letting it be there as we cultivate non-distraction, that the knowing and all the activity that's being known is nature, not self, just a natural impersonal activity that we call mind or that we call heart. So in your own way, just marry those two things your interest in non-distraction and this pointing out teaching from the Buddha that the nature of the mind is this impersonal activity. It's natural. It's not really self in the way that we usually understand it. Habits, tendencies of the mind That's nature, not self. Consciousness itself, nature, not self. And this information is offered from the Buddha, this pointing out, not to become something to think about, but simply to help us be more intimate with the nature of things, with what's happening. So then meditation is this non-distracted awareness of nature, the unfolding nature of our experience. And it doesn't really matter if the mind is in a full-blown reactive pattern 
or the mind is calm and peaceful, both in a sense are a natural unfolding of nature being known. And often it helps to give the knowing mind a a more particular aspect of the present moment to pay attention to, such as feeling the whole body sitting, or more specifically feeling the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. And again, this is just a place, like if we're observing the natural rhythm of breathing in and breathing out, for example, it's just a working ground or training ground to practice, to be interested in this non-distraction and to contemplate that whatever it is that's here, the breath being known, that that's nature. It's just a natural and personal unfolding, breathing in being known, breathing out being known. Doesn't need to be more or less than that. So let's continue for a while in silence. And especially this morning, be interested in that moment where the mind is lost in thought. And then there's that recognition, the mind is lost in thought. So of course, when the mind is lost in thought, there's no awareness of that. But at some point, the mind knows that it's been distracted. We really wanna honor that moment of recognition. Oh, this is the residual of the mind having been lost in thought. It feels like this, it's like this. This experience is being known. 
course, you don't need to use any of that, those words or that language. But really honor that moment of recognizing that the mind has been lost in thought, not as a failure, but as a success. Oh, it's really good to know that the mind had been lost in thought. And I'm grateful to feel what the residual feels like in the body and the mind, because there might be residual tension as a result of having been lost in thought. And we simply submit to whatever's left over, even if it's unpleasant. Grateful to no longer be lost in thought, but also noticing the draw, the seductiveness of getting back, going back into the content. Just like an addict is as destructive as the addiction might be, as an addict, we're drawn back for another fix. And it's the same with mental proliferation, regardless of what the mind has been thinking about. There's something seductive about being lost in thought. And we wanna notice both the draw, the juiciness, and the relief that arises when we've noticed that we've been lost in thought, the release of any tension or whatever that experience is like for you.
See how many times you can notice that moment of the mind having been distracted and now is aware of having been distracted. And count that as a success in your practice. That moment of recognition of having been distracted. And we're keeping it really simple this morning. Interested in the experience of non-distraction and bringing in this pointing out instruction from the Buddha that all of this, both the knowing and what is being known, all of this is nature, not self. So we're understanding the experience of non-distraction as nature, not personal.
simply recognize that this experience is being known, being felt. It's nature, the nature of things to unfold and feel this way, not really personal. So when our practice is as simple as non-distraction, cultivating non-distracted awareness, well, that means that everything belongs. We're not expecting or needing experience to be one way or another. Instead, it's just a matter of recognizing this is being known or this is being felt. And even if there's a, some kind of personal reaction to our experience, that reactivity itself is just something being known, something being felt. And just acknowledge it as the next thing that's being known. And then in a sense, stepping back and recognizing all of it as nature, lawful nature for things to be the way they are. Take a little bit of time and adjust your body. 
So you feel comfortable. Happy New Year, everyone. I trust you're healthy and doing well. And of course, we say that always knowing that, you know, with this size group, not everybody's doing well and not everybody's healthy for sure. And uh, yeah, it's just like that, that truth of brokenness or tenderness when we're honest about our own situation and everybody else's situation. And actually that allows us to show up in a more real, honest way, instead of superficially imagining that everybody's fine or even imagining that we're fine. But just that sense that no, that really doesn't happen <laughs> in this realm, right? On human existence. I was, uh, Kyoko Karayama, one of our teachers, uh, heard that interview with Brian Stevenson and Krista Tippetts. I don't know when it was, but recently on that radio, that uh, national public radio program on being, it's called. I hear it on Sunday morning. I think they probably play it a few times during the week, but for sure it's on early on Sunday mornings. And, um, but he was saying, you know, he works with, people that uh, have been sentenced to death, at least some of them, and then really checking to see if the case was handled correctly. Um, and I think it's called the Equal Justice Initiative. He's the person, by the way, who wrote a well-known book called Just Mercy. Um, and I think recently there was a movie, I think I saw it, that they did a biopic on uh, Brian Stevenson, which I thought was pretty good. But he's, he's an impressive person. And anyway, in this interview uh, with Krista Tippetts, he's talking about you know the people he works with, people on death row, basically. And uh, let me just read you this passage. I do think what sustains me is this knowledge I have that it's really the broken among us that can contribute a lot to our quest for full equal justice. When you're broken, you actually, you know, you, you actually know something about what it means to be human. You know something about grace. You learn something about mercy. You've learned something about forgiveness. It's the broken among us that can teach us some things. And knowing that you don't have to be perfect and complete gives you a way of moving through challenge that would be hard if you think that that's not something that's possible. And this has been uh, something just generally in our community, the Common Ground community, we've been trying to integrate. Um, some of you might remember Sue Cochran, a longtime leader at the center, and Sue's been struggling with many different cancers over the uh, many years now and uh, right now it's not doing that well. Um, but uh, Sue's written really beautifully about this teaching of brokenness as a kind of power, superpower even, making peace with our brokenness, as opposed to living our life as if I have to be perfect to be worthy. And the power comes from discovering the capacity to acknowledge and actually be okay with being imperfect or being broken. And th that's true in terms of our own personality and mental conditioning, emotional qualities, but also like the world, the larger world. And in a way we can't really meet our experience, like even in terms of a moment of mindfulness and we can't meet our partners and our friends and our families and our world if we have this expectation that things should be perfect. And when that gets so painful, because things aren't perfect, but we expect them to be perfect, then we, what do we do? We get lost in thought, lost in our imaginings and our fantasies, because we have 
some control about these fantasies and imaginings, right? And we can, you know, disappear because we don't know how to be real and intimate with the world as it is, which is broken or imperfect or messy or ambiguous. Doesn't really conform to our, our, our ideas about it. And I think there's a lot just in terms of our practice of non-distraction, like, I don't know about the rest of you. We traveled yesterday and that was a real adventure, you know, flying from Minneapolis to Philadelphia and then renting a car and driving out to where we are now. And uh, so I was tired this morning preparing this talk. (laughs) And so I I was kind of getting my notes together and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll sit a little bit. And my mind was like glue. <laughs> I mean, it just couldn't do anything. And, uh, and it was just interesting to see like my mind not, it wasn't unpleasant, but it just didn't want to be clear and awake. It just didn't. And it would just sort of slip into some gooey, dreamy, relatively pleasant place, you know? And then I'd realize I was, I was distracted. I was lost in some gooey, sweet place. And I, I, you know, I just kind of recognize that, but it's just like, there was no integrity. No, I couldn't, the mind couldn't find its interest in reality. It's interest in being real. And this is not that uncommon. And in fact, it's a real step in the right direction in our practice, the more honest, honestly, we see these tendencies of the mind to not want to be in that clear, present, stable place, that it's not the habit. Another thing that Brian Stevenson talks about in that, in that interview with Krista Tippetts that I thought was interesting is, uh, he, and he sort of refers to the Christian ministers and, you know, people who want redemption, but think that wanting redemption, like in a Christian sense, is enough. And he writes, or he said in the interview, um, because in the faith tradition I grew up in, you can't come into the church and say, oh, I want salvation and redemption and all the good stuff, but I don't want to admit to anything bad. I don't want to have to talk about anything bad that I've done. The preachers will tell you it doesn't work like that. You've got to first repent. You have to confess. And they try to make you understand that repentance and confession isn't something you should fear, but something you should embrace. Because what it does is open up the possibility of redemption and salvation. And I think in Buddhism, we have an equivalent of that. Like there's a real price to pay for opening, (laughs) right? One of the prices we pay for opening to the present moment is what it feels like to have been basically not open to the present moment most of the time in the past. So we feel the cumulative effect of being in denial, being distracted, being superficial, being pushed around by our likes and dislikes, our hopes and fears. I mean, basically what the mind, the thinking mind has been caught up in. And then we get prompted or inspired to be present. And then we're faced with the price. Like, okay, you can be present, but there's a cost to being present. You have to feel what it feels like for not having been that present in the past. You have to feel what the body feels like when it hasn't been that clear because the mind has been distracted. And basically in its dramas, and then the body is the recipient of all that tension of those mental dramas. So we kind of like the idea of being radically present and open and clear and open-hearted and all those things we read about and hear about. And we think about that a lot, but we generally don't do it very much. 
even those of us who've been around for a while, when we're really honest about like a given day, how much of the day is the mind really in that profound balance of presence, open and clear and sensitive and intimate and, and really connecting both with the breath and the depth of what's here and now. Those are, you know, those are uh, healing moments, but they're still relatively rare. You know, we're kind of, we, with practice, we can be more and more in the vicinity of that stable, intimate presence, but at a safe distance too, you know, like using distractedness, using our thoughts about this and this, even our thoughts about being mindful kind of keep us, can keep the heart at a safe distance. It's one of the things that people report when they have opportunities to go on retreat is just how obsessively they're thinking about meditation while they're on retreat. And it's just the way, you know, it's uh, the mind, the heart, the conditioned habits. They're just doing what they've been conditioned to do, but it isn't personal. But it's nice to, to get this teaching that there's a price to pay because then we're less surprised when we sit down or even throughout the day and we're reminded to be present and we realize how challenging it is. I mean, it's not that hard to be present for a moment, <clears throat> but I find it, I think it's pretty universal that it can be challenging to sustain that mindfulness through activity, especially, you know, being out in the world, doing what we do. <clears throat> and I think that's why Thich Nhat Hanh has this really simple, potent teaching where he says, uh, maybe people don't know, but <clears throat> Thich Nhat Hanh is a very well-known Vietnamese Buddhist monk, quite old now, um, back in Vietnam after having been in the West for many decades. And, uh, but he had the simple teaching, forgetfulness is our only enemy. I think that's a very powerful teaching because we turn a lot of stuff into enemies. Our painful knee can be an enemy. A disturbing sound can be an enemy. Too much energy, too much coffee can be an enemy. Too, not enough caffeine can be an enemy. Sleepiness can be an enemy. <clears throat> we can turn anything into a problem, but it's really this deep habit of forgetfulness. <clears throat> We're forgetting to apply the teaching, basically. And the teachings are very simple. I mean, they can become complex, but in their essence, they're very simple. Right? It's the teaching, the invitation of non-distractedness, <clears throat> being aware that this is being known. That's, that's what we mean by non-distraction. Oh, this is being known. This is being felt. So when the mind knows what's here and now, is interested in what's here and now, that's non-distraction. When the mind is lost in thought, so it's, but not aware that it's lost in thought, not aware that it's thinking, that's distraction. Or is aware of something, but like aware of something in its depth, but not sort of with that continuity, not able to comprehend that it's part of this wider, larger dynamic of things coming and going. There's delusion, distractedness in that as well. So it's just this interest in non-distraction. And you can just check what that is right now for you. What is non What is the experience, <clears throat> not the concept, but what is the experience of non-distraction? Do you need, <clears throat> do we need a different moment than the one that's here to recognize non-distraction? We often tend to overshoot like we think that non-distraction is more complicated than it actually is, or that there's somebody who has to do something to realize non-distraction. 
but it's much more about the cessation of doing something like ceasing being lost in thought or identified with thought. So as uh, Thich Nhat, uh, not Thich Nhat Hanh, but uh, one of my teachers, Saida Utejaniya says, uh, more recognizing, less doing <laughs> in terms of meditation. Right? Just, we're just recognizing what's being known, remembering to recognize what's being known. The knowing mind awareness in a sense is here and now. It's like the space of the mind, this potential of knowing consciousness. But we don't remember to recognize it. Oh yeah, there is a knowing and the knowing is knowing this, feeling this. So now again, what is the experience of non-distraction? And it might be self-consciousness being known because I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, that little tension of self-consciousness is being felt. Or it might be you notice the visual experience of looking at the screen. I can hear the surf of the ocean where I am right now, hearing, being known. And then we're marrying, as I said, in the guided meditation, that experience of non-distraction, then we're bringing in a particular frame or perspective or way of perceiving the experience of non-distraction, which is to practice perceiving it as a movement of nature. Instead, to replace my habit of viewing the experience of non-distraction as my experience or happening to me or some self-centered reference. And that's it. And, you know, a lot of meditation practice, and I'm going to start next Sunday with a series of talks and instructions on the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of breathing, the Anapanasati Sutta. And it's in a very practical way. It's one of the most simple, complete sets of meditation instructions the Buddha gave. And it's the way the Buddha practiced himself most of the time in terms of his meditation practice. And that alone, just as an, an aside, is kind of an astounding fact that the Buddha, an awakened one, had a meditation practice. I thought we were meditating so we didn't have to keep meditating, right? I mean, that's how we think about these things. It's like, oh yeah, I'll do this. I'll take my medicine so I can get to that place where I don't need medicine. And so, but this is an important understanding about the path and the practice that there's so it's really like a path or a practice of being human being. And it, that, that allows us to be a human being in the most practical or pragmatic, skillful, useful way. In a way, I, I remember hearing this very early in the eighties when I was just starting to meditate in the early eighties, 1980s. And uh, I forget who said it, but you know, if you want to be peaceful, well, you practice being peaceful. If you want to be at ease with whatever is happening in the moment, then you practice being intimate and at ease with whatever's happening in the moment. If you want to be unafraid, you practice being intimate and unafraid. If you want to be kind, you practice being intimate. Like we always have to use what's happening to practice the way we want to be. We don't want to put it off for the future. So this, uh, you know, the non-distraction and the freedom that we're, the heart is really interested in. I mean, whether we acknowledge it or not, we intuit there's a possibility of real peace or real release but that's only going to be relevant if we bring it into the here and now. Intimacy is just another way of talking about non-distraction. And then the freedom, that's that pointing out instruction from the Buddha. This is nature. It's not self. It's not personal. 
because that brings that sense of ease and wholeness into the moment. It's all our ideas, our self-centered ideas that fragment the present moment experience. It's that self-centered overlay that creates this sort of existential angst and anxiety that we live with most of the time. So we have to practice Right, the, you know, the pointing out instructions, we have to practice perceiving being intimate with this point of view and see if it works. So it's not like um, something to believe in. Oh yeah, it's all nature, it's not really personal. It's a more pragmatic approach, the Buddhist teachings. Like use this frame Learn how to be intimate, learn how to be, to live more and more in a non-distracted way. Cultivate a formal sitting time. So you have more time, you know, and uh, simple time or supportive time to practice non-distraction, to practice being intimate with what's coming and going, with what's unfolding. This is being known, this is being felt, it's like this. And then bring in the wisdom teachings and see if it allows you to be even more intimate and more free and just in a practical way with your experiencing, with the experience you're experiencing. Is it helpful? And this is what the Buddha means, like the practice or the teachings, they're meant to be you know, practical, helpful, conducive of peace in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. So Saida Utejaniya, this uh, Burmese teacher that I've been able to study with and have learned a lot from, uh, he says, the mind is a natural phenomena. You're, you are practicing to discover this nature, that the mind, the body, that all of this is a natural phenomenon. And you know, the whole approach to non-distraction, we have different skillful means. So I just wanna review them. Like one skillful means that can be very useful when I talked a couple of weeks ago about mental proliferation, diffuseness, distractedness, and just the addiction really the, uh, the part of the mind we call pain attention, like that attention is really addicted to the diversity of our present moment experience. It feels like I can see off in the distance out the windows, you know, people are moving and there's some kind of habitual obligation like to look and to have an opinion about what I'm seeing. And every time I hear the sounds in the background, like there's that psychological obligation to recognize that perception and to have an opinion. Like I like it, I don't like it, it's bothersome, I wish there was more of it. And this is what I mean about this habit of our mind, this deep tendency to, and this really part of our, the evolution of our animal nature, like to have that radar about what's going on through the different senses, or sight, or sound, touch, smell, taste. So a lot of what we do initially to get a deeper understanding of what non-distraction is, is we basically hand attention, the knowing mind, something to be attentive to. Something relatively simple, relatively concrete. When we're doing walking meditation, it's just the, it can be just the physicality of lifting and placing the foot. So we're simplifying the great diversity of present moment experience. And we're saying to the knowing mind, just practice knowing the lifting and the placing of each step. Or if you're sitting and we're working with the breath as your primary meditation anchor, just notice that rising and the falling of the abdomen with the in and out breath, or that coolness of the touching as the air goes in the nostrils 
and the relative warmth of the air as it comes out of the nostrils, or just that touching as it goes in and out. And it creates that more simple working ground because when we've given the mind a particular tether, particular anchor, it's much easier to notice when we're distracted, <coughs> right? Because we're not with the anchor. And whenever we're not with the anchor, because we've resolved to be with the anchor, we know that the attention has got drawn into some drama, some exploration, some analysis, some comparing, some fantasy, some whatever. So all of us, you know, in different ways, we want to develop, to cultivate that training ground. And there's some, you know, you have some flexibility. It's really okay for you to choose, but sometimes that's going to be really important meditative work to work with a particular meditation anchor or meditation object. And it's, there's nothing necessarily special about the breath or the whole body awareness or using loving kindness as a psychological attitude as your meditation anchor. There are many different anchors. But the real point for most of this work is helping the mind realize it doesn't need to be dependent on the diversity of experience doesn't need to be attentive to the diversity of experience. It can feel like a death because it's such a deep tendency in the mind to want to be attentive that to just be interested in one thing. And remember, it could be something ordinary like washing the dishes and just aware of the experience of touch, the warmth of the water, the felt sense of wetness, the hardness of the plates. So that exclusive quality of the meditation object requires attention to be non-attentive to everything else. Even though the senses still work, ears still hear, nose still smells, body still has lots of different touches, lots of different sights. The attention is choosing to be aware of one thing and it's realizing that it can let go of everything else. It can be not attentive to everything else. And that letting go just on that basic level, like letting something happen in the background. I mean, it's really essential just to be a functioning human being. Those of you who raise kids to survive, you have to sometimes not be aware of what the kids are doing so that then at other times you can really show up. If you're always vigilant, you get exhausted and burnt out, right? Or if you have to do a particular task, then you have to let go of all the other tasks your mind might be involved with. So it's just part of human competence, but we want to develop this because it's not so much that we want that one pointed focus on a singular object, but we want to notice the pleasure of a more simple mind. Because when the mind is just aware of one thing, like the breath going in and out, there's a healing that happens. The mind has a little respite, a little space from its habit of getting pushed around, knowing this object, liking it or not liking it, thinking about it, thinking about what it's thinking about, right? And then another stimuli, and then, an, and this really fragments the heart and mind. So when we're paying attention to a wholesome object or a relatively neutral object like breathing in and breathing out, then the simplicity of the object and the exclusive nature, the mind begins to notice not just the breathing in and breathing out, but the mind also notice the, the relative unification, the relative wholeness, non-fragmentedness of the mind. 
and that feels good. It has a good, I think you could say visceral feeling, even though we're talking about the heart and mind, there's a felt sense of that wholeness of samadhi, of unification, non-distractedness. And that's really important because it has a particular flavor, that flavor of non-distraction that we're basically going to follow all along the path of awakening. We talk a lot in the tradition about the joy of renunciation or the flavor of peace and ease. But all of these wholesome inner qualities really have to do with the heart and mind not losing its wholeness. And, you know, usually the mind loses its wholeness because it's confused by its likes and dislikes. It's experiencing experiences and it's interpreting its experiencing as self. So then its likes and dislikes have a kind of power to disrupt and fragment and disturb and agitate the mind. So we want to learn how to be a sensitive human being with the diversity of experiences without that fragmentation, without anything uh, causing the heart to waver. So we can, that intimacy and that sense of wholeness can be sustained even do, during really difficult moments of experience. So when initially we learn it by profoundly simplifying our experience. So the equanimity, the peace, the ease, the wholeness, we would say is a function of the mind being really retreated from disturbing experience. But that's okay, because we learn what it's like for the mind to be not disturbed, even though not being disturbed is being dependent on being in a really good place when no one's disturbing me. But at least I know what it's like for my heart to be unfragmented, whole, stable, clear, deeply sensitive, really feeling. I can trust the moment to really feel into it. Even though I'm, I'm dependent on the simplicity of my experience, but that I learn to trust the present moment. I learn what it's like to not be afraid. I learn what it's like to put down all my armor, all my defensiveness. So much of our habits of distraction are self-protection. It's like we're, we feel protected being lost in thought in all the ways we're lost in thought. And you know, a lot of our thinking, our being lost in thought, it's really not that skillful or pleasant, but it's familiar. <laughs> so we feel safe in it. Our worrying, our hoping, our you know, regurgitating past wounds and you know insults and fantasies of revenge and all that kind of stuff. A lot of that we would call unskillful thinking. But it's like a warm blanket because it's so familiar and we wrap ourselves in it over and over again. So we first learn to construct a really skillful place. We call that concentration basically or samadhi where we learn to retreat. We use a meditation object like loving kindness or the breath or the whole body awareness. Some people even use hearing, walking meditation simple task, knitting. I'm wearing a sweater that my mother-in-law knitted. And, uh, you know, it's like for some people who knit, it's a real concentration activity. You know, they're just get absorbed. And, to, and this is a particularly intricate sweater. You know, you can't space out. And so most of the bandwidth of the mind is used to use to, to do the knitting. So there's very little space in the mind to worry, to want, to fear, to do these fragmenting activities. 
And so this is the first, often the first step in meditation is just to learn what it feels like when the mind is undisturbed and to notice that pleasant sense of wholeness and to notice this capacity for sensitivity and intimacy because we're not distracted and we're not, the mind is not afraid to be open and to be sensitive. And then we just bring that into life. But even there in our sits, we'll get a little samadhi, some of the wholeness, and then one of something will happen and a little drama will arise. Maybe a painful memory will come up, but something will disturb the wholeness. So right there in our sit, even before the sitting ends and we're back in our relationships and our activities, especially in our sits, you know, these little, I think I called them whirlpools that happen. These little spinning of the mind, these little self dramas are sometimes they're not so little. And then we have this opportunity, oh, this is being known, this is nature, not self. So those same two things, being not distracted with the whirlpool, with the drama and the emotion and the agitation in the body and the agitation in the mind. Oh yeah, this is being known, this is being felt. And we bring in the wisdom teaching from the Buddha. Oh, maybe this is just nature. Maybe all of this activity, psychological, emotional, physical, external, internal, maybe all the stuff that's being known is nature, not self. So we use that wisdom to shift the way we're relating, perceiving this experience of being caught up in some drama, whatever it is. Could be an excitement drama, right? It's not always like regurgitating some painful thing from the past. It might be like things are going really well in my life and I like this and I like that. And maybe in, and we're kind of in some becoming fantasy of becoming the person we want to become. And there's a lot of juice, a lot of excitement. But whatever it is, can we just see it as something being known, being felt, nature, not self, not really that personal, not really referring back to anybody. It's just stuff being felt and known, not more, not less than the actual experience right now, which is, this is being known. And that's how we take the peace and the healing we get when we're using a more exclusive meditation object like the breath, and we start to bring it into these little disturbances or big disturbances or after the sit ends into our daily life. Well, what would it like, be like to be intimate and free of disturbance, free of agitation, free of psychic weight, even as I'm reading the news? even as I'm dealing with the sticky problems in my life or success, you know, whatever it is that might stir the pot for us. So feel free, you know, a lot of times questions come up in practice. And so uh, recently we've started a number of community practice check-ins. So there's time for people to ask questions. So every Tuesday at 12 noon central time, uh, Stacy McClendon and I uh, meet with the community from 12 noon to one. And then Shelly meets with uh, the community for a practice check-in every or almost every Thursday at 9 a.m. And then Win Fricky and I do it one Saturday a month, usually the third Saturday a month at 8 a.m. So it's just a great time for a guided meditation and then uh, Q&A and discussion time with whoever shows up. And they've been very rich uh, since we started it with COVID. Hopefully we'll continue doing it even knock on wood when we're back in person at the center. We'll continue doing some of these things online, maybe a lot of these things online. And I just wanna mention, we have an intro class beginning a week from Tuesday and the winter Buddhist studies class is beginning a week from Monday, a week from tomorrow. That's gonna be on mindfulness of the body and this Saturday, there's a half day retreat from 1 p.m. until five, again, all central time. We're still looking for a few more folks to help with the snow blowing at the city center in Minneapolis. So if you live 
locally and want to help out, just contact Gabe at the center and that would be great. So nice to be with everybody. And thank you, Shannon, for organizing the small groups. I'll make you host now. <laughs>